All right. So when you first started to realize that, and, and you were in San Francisco, so San Francisco was way ahead of the rest of the country. When you first started to realize this was going to be a, a, a big thing and then the city started to shut down, um, walk us through kind of your 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 response in the first days and weeks um, once it became clear that this pandemic was going to be real and you guys were going to be shut down. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I remember it was late February uh, when I started to get really concerned uh, that what we were seeing, you know, happening in China was definitely coming. It was only a matter of time. Uh, I remember scrambling around Twitter, you know, obviously a, a site we all love to hate, but at the same time, I was able to quickly find, you know, some of the top uh, epidemiologists. And so I started following, uh, you know, what they were saying. Um, and it was, it was very concerning. Um, and so we, we started planning in that, you know, kind of late February, early March phase for what are we going to do if and when, and probably when we're going to start having to shut down offices. Um, and that was dramatic. People were shocked. I mean, you know, it took, a, I think, a, a little while for everyone to get on board because everything felt normal at that time, like creating that sense of urgency, I would say, was difficult. Uh, and as soon as we got really serious about it, we we ran into the problem of, well, we have this large sales team, thousands of people, and they have desktop <laughs> computers. Like in a in a you know, if we all had to go home, like how do we keep them functioning? How do we keep wow. the sales team up and running? Uh, and so we started scrambling to buy three million dollars worth of laptops, <laughs> for wow. example. So we probably we probably placed one of the largest uh, orders for Chromebooks, uh, you know, in the, in the history of Chromebooks, baby. Wow. But um, you know, we were able to secure laptops uh, and headsets for all these people within a few weeks, and and sure enough, you know, San Francisco was the first office to close right around the same time as some of the other big tech firms uh, closed, and then you know the situation started. To continue as expected, get worse, you know, in places like New York. And so we, you know, quickly soon after uh, shut down New York and then the other cities, you know, yeah. pretty soon after that. Um, yeah. I know, I know that in April, I mean, this has been like for many of the businesses and, and entrepreneurs that have been on this show, this has been, and I appreciate you coming on because it's been a tough mm-hmm. year. Um, okay. But it's important. And, and for anybody watching, the reason why we do this show, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen this edition yet, is because we want you to understand that the people that you think of as, you know, these, these you know, successful entrepreneurs and they've got it made, they're also going through some really challenging times right now. And so this is really designed to kind of walk us through how businesses are building resilience and, and hopefully give you ideas and all of us ideas on how we can build that into our, our own businesses and our own workflows. So um, let's start with restaurants. I mean, this industry has just been absolutely hammered, um, unlike any other industry, travel and leisure as well. And we did a whole week on restaurants um, back in the summer. Um, so so many people go to Yelp for restaurants. So did, did you anticipate that pre- pretty quickly early on that restaurants were going to get hit or did that come as a surprise to you? We, we had some sense that restaurants were going to get hit. Um, you know, one of our uh, more senior product managers, uh, it was Chinese uh, person who had lots of contacts in China and was relaying like all the changes that restaurants were going through in China to try and adapt. Uh, you know, at, at the outset of the pandemic, it looked like this is crazy. Like, you know, they're doing all these things with temperature checks at the door and like deliver, you know, new delivery things and partitions. And it just seemed so unlikely that that could be our reality you know, especially at that time, call it early March when we were studying this and everything still felt normal. Uh, but it was, you know, pretty soon we could start seeing impacts uh, in some of the cities that were hardest hit first in the U.S. So, for example, Seattle, uh, you know, we did see pretty clearly in the data, uh, probably by right around mid-March, that restaurant searches were being impacted. People were searching less uh, in that area. And so, you know, that obviously got us thinking about business ramifications and, okay, yeah. restaurants, you know, which is a big portion of, of our traffic are going to be hard hit. You know, what can we do? Uh, and so we started scrambling on setting things up uh, to make sure that, you know, we weren't going to try and charge restaurants, for instance, for that period where traffic was falling. And even if they were getting some value, like, you know, the, everyone is thrown into total chaos and like there really isn't a whole lot of point to, to advertising 
uh, and spending advertising dollars, you know, as, as traffic is falling like that. So, so pulling together a bunch of different things to support the restaurant and nightlife industry at that time became a big priority and, and ultimately culminated with about $32 million, uh, you know, worth of forgiven uh, fees and, and yeah. other things to support restaurants. Jeremy, your business model, and correct me if I'm wrong, is is depends largely on a, on advertising on on businesses that advertise um, on the platform, and, uh, yeah. and 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 lots of businesses depend on that. I mean, I mean, public right, NPR does. We depend on that's part of what we depend on on sponsorship, mm-hmm. um, and and businesses that have really you know podcast businesses that depend on ads have had a difficult time because companies are cutting back on their ad spends for obvious reasons. They've got to preserve cash in, in, in many cases. Um, and this has actually pretty dramatically affected your business, Yelp's business, right? I mean, over the, over the past, over the past year. That was one of the scariest things, uh, particularly about March and April was, you know, in a pandemic, especially as things are shutting down, who's buying advertising, right? Right. Uh, so that was my great fear uh, during that early period was, you know, is our revenue going to go, t- or, you know, towards zero? Like maybe it's not zero, but is it going to go towards zero pretty darn quickly? Uh, and so we had some very uh, stressful, difficult conversations early on as a management team and also, you know, in, uh, you know, in talking to the board around like the different potentially catastrophic scenarios. What would we do? How do we survive? You know, is there a freeze the company in Amber type strategy literally was, was something we were talking about, like where we just go down to the the skeleton of staff. If it's a a nuclear winter type of situation, ultimately, you know, as we got more information and and we're able to calibrate, you know, our approach, I think we, we landed on a plan that wasn't a a complete nuclear winter. We kind of anticipated something around a 50% drop. Um, and so we started, you know, making adjustment, very difficult decisions and adjustments to the business and personnel to accommodate, you know, that potential future. And at its worst, you know, we were seeing something, you know, not quite 50%, but, but headed towards there. You know, fortunately, the world did start to restabilize. And as the panic subsided, you know, there were businesses that actually were doing even fine or, or good, uh, you know, like as all of us were sheltered at home, suddenly if your toilet backed up, you're calling the plum- plumbers ended right. up being more you know, busier. And some people started moving, uh, you know, later in the, the pandemic, some mover traffic uh, was doing uh, reasonably well. And so there ended up being areas of our business because we are diversified. We're known obviously widely for restaurants, but we also have, uh, you know, both reviews and customers in all sorts of local services categories as well. And that area of the business has been quite uh, right. resilient. Yeah. Contractors and 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 so mm-hmm, on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. I remember when you were on the podcast. Um, there were two moments you talked about, oh, and, and I want to get back to this later. But you talked about two crisis moments. I remember one was when you were X dot com, and you were just totally terrified that I think that PayPal was going to like crush you guys, and and you had sleepless nights about that. And then the other one was when you started Yelp, and nobody came to the party. Like it was really, it just didn't gain any traction in the, in the early months, many months. Yeah. And, and yeah. you were really worried. You had a lot of anxiety about it. And you talked about that. And, um, and this sounds like even more intense, what you went through in March and April, just probably personally, I mean, planning for a nuclear winter, but in, in some, some senses, like, I wonder whether that's actually, I mean, it, it, that, that planning for the worst case scenario and anticipating that possibility actually was in a sense probably the best way to game out you know game out what your strategy would be because in the end it didn't work out that way but it but you were planning for the worst yeah one of the things that i would say was beneficial of going to that awful place in our minds well you know i'd say at the early part of the pandemic it's hard for people to really wrap their heads around the scope of the problem, how big the problem is, how it's going to change our lives. It just seems unbelievable. Um, And so by forcing other executives, managers, et cetera, to start thinking about this, this could be the big one, so to speak, you know, it gets you into a a brain space that, you know, fortunately we we didn't stay there and we didn't have to, to be there, but it did shift everyone's thinking to, okay, this is a big problem. We have to take this, uh, you know, take this extremely seriously and there's going to be 
big changes and moves that none of us are going to like, but we have to do to ensure the survival of the business. So I'd say from that perspective, being, you know, and maybe it's my, you know, maybe I, I'm overreactive or I was overly paranoid, but I, I do feel like it created a sense of urgency within the organization that, hey, this is a very big challenge for the company. And so we need to be, you know, light on our feet. Uh, everything's on the table, all ideas need to be heard and vetted because this is a, a big problem for our business, which it ended up being, uh, you know, things came back, uh, you know, in the, in the subsequent months. And, and so I would say, you know, the, the damage wasn't as bad as we feared, but, you know, that was a very big, scary chapter for the company. Yeah, on, on par with the anxiety of the beginning when we launched and nobody came. <laughs> wanted to use the site that was pretty bad too but this right. was you know this was bad because it was also affecting all of our real world lives you know we're, yeah. we're all dealing with our own fears of of you know the of the virus and how it's affecting our families and people that get that we know that get sick and so forth and of course you had to have layoffs i mean you i think layoffs furloughs pay cuts i mean you basically sounds like you you had to implement all of these things and other things in order to to preserve the to keep 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 things afloat yeah yeah uh you know that was one of the hardest personal things for me uh was thinking about hey we're entering into this pandemic you know advertising revenue is potentially evaporating we only have so much money in the bank what do we, you know how do we ensure the survival of the company can we ensure the survival of the company was you know the the thing that, that i was focused on but that meant we can't maintain you know if we can't sell any advertising we can't employ all of you know these sales people and so how do we how do we manage that and how do we do so you know in a way that cushions people as much as possible how can we you know be empathetic and communicate clearly and be as generous as we can while still you know keeping the company afloat and so you're trying to balance all of these very difficult aspects as you're making these decisions that affect people's lives. And uh, it was brutal. It was brutal. Um, you know, uh, the one, you know, the one thing that, that I feel a bit better about is as we were looking at these changes, you know, ma making these tough decisions for the company, you know, we were able to carve out a group and say, okay, well, some of these people, like we, we simply know we're not going to be able to afford them for a long time. So let's figure out how to handle that gracefully as we can. You know, some of these other people, uh, you know, that are trained that have been with us for years, like maybe we can put them on pause for a few months and bring them back. And so that was kind of the furlough decision. And we took our best guess of how long, how long can we put these people uh, on pause and then potentially afford to, to bring them back back on um and so it ended up being a thousand people uh that we put on furlough uh and we said at the outset hey this we think our best guess is is we think this is four months and uh unfortunately that guess proved to be accurate and at the end of the four months we were able to start bringing people back uh and you know the vast majority of them i think something like 70 80 percent of them are, are back working at yelp which is fantastic i mean obviously that they made a huge sacrifice themselves not working uh, for you know four months and and I don't want to you know obviously I recognize that that that's difficult in and of itself but it does feel good that hey given this crazy natural disaster that right. we were able to take these people that are loyal to Yelp uh, you know that, that have been great to Yelp and, and bring them back on that feels good. Um, we're taking questions for Jeremy Stoppelman, co-founder uh, founder and CEO of Yelp. Um, so please keep those coming in. We'll get to those in just a moment. Jeremy, I want to I want to kind of switch gears for a second. Ask you about um, about strategies, resilient strategies. I mean, you you mentioned earlier that with your team, you said, "Hey, all ideas are on the table," and not presumably not just ideas to 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 staunch the the the, the bleeding, to stop the bleeding, but also to think of new ways to build out revenue right new ideas that could create new revenue streams so let's talk about some ideas and, and some um some initiatives that you've put out there that might you know that that might actually redefine yelp you know in the future what are what are some things that you've started to do on the platform since the pandemic started that that are different I mean, there's so much stuff uh related to obviously covid um you know, in particular, business data becomes so much more important. 
uh, it was already hard to corral things like, you know, the hours of a business and consumers really value it. Uh, and it, it changes. And so it's hard to keep keep up to up to date. We rely on the community as well as business owners to submit some of that stuff. Um, but we really felt like we needed to turn it, turn it up a notch. Uh, and so we now have, you know, hours that but they're also listed with when it was last updated. So you can get a, a true sense of like, OK, is this fresh? Can I rely on this data? We've also done a lot of data gathering ourselves. So for lots of popular businesses all over the country, we've been scrambling uh, with our own personnel to try and make sure that you know the most important listings have the most accurate information. Also, one of the things we heard from from both business owners and consumers is, "Hey, I'm, you know, I care about my safety uh, yeah. as a consumer. I care about my safety. I want to know before I go, like, what is this business doing?" And business owners that are trying to make their customers safe are saying. I want to be able to broadcast like, you know, what my approach is uh, to keeping people safe. You know, employees are wearing masks or, or what have you. And how do I put that out there for people to see? So, you know, we have a whole section now dedicated to COVID-19 safety, health and safety, where businesses can publish uh, the things that they're doing. We have, you know, the future iteration of it that, that we're working on is actually allowing consumers also to provide some feedback on like, yes, I'm seeing this. And so really make sure that, that it's reliable, robust information. Uh, but that's, you know, that's one example of, of the here and now. There's also things that are probably here to stay that are new for us, like, you know, right. virtual appointments. I mean, healthcare has been transformed by video appointments. I've seen a doctor recently over, over yeah. video and that was a great experience. Like, you know, HIPAA apparently got in the way. And so I think, you know, it, it's been softened for the time being. And yeah. I hope that stays because it's a, a really great benefit. Uh, and, so, and so we are realizing that there's certain services that we can experience at home that are local services, but you don't actually need to meet in person. And that's great. It's a time saver. It's convenience, et cetera. Yeah. I noticed that also you, um, there's a, a new feature where black owned businesses can identify as black owned. And that's really mm -hmm. actually um, brought a lot of support to black owned businesses in the wake of the, of the demonstrations, um, um, against racial injustice. Do yeah. you, do you anticipate sort of more initiatives like that, um, coming out of this? I mean, I, I'm assuming that that was unanticipated, but that seems like it's been pretty successful. Yeah. Yeah. The, it has been a successful initiative, very well received, uh, you know, in the wake of, of George, George Floyd's murder, uh, and the, the subsequent social unrest, uh, you know, we launched into action both internally at Yelp to understand, you know, what's going on, how do our black employees feel, how's their work experience, but then also externally, what can we do to support, you know, black community members and black business owners? And one of the things that we heard loud and clear was, hey, if I'm a black business owner and I want to tell people that I'm there and I want to be searchable and found as a black business owner, we should provide that. And so we got to work, uh, and that became uh, an urgent uh, pro product priority, and uh, we got it done. So, you know, businesses can mark themselves as Black-owned. We also pulled together, of, of the businesses that identified, we pulled together collections. We're able to promote those uh, throughout the site and app. We also just promoted, you know, being able to search across Black-owned owned businesses, and, and we actually saw a rise in searches for these businesses uh, subsequently. So it's been a really great success story. And uh, more recently, we, we also did that for Latinx businesses. Um, yeah. And so there's now an, an attribute for uh, Latinx business owners that want to self-identify where the, the whole playbook is coming uh, into use again. And it's great, it, you know, for, it, it's a great way to support uh, communities, um, you know, that want to be seen and heard and deserve our, our support. And so we're really proud of that work. Jeremy, we're getting lots of questions about two topics related to reviews. So I'm going to mm -hmm. paraphrase them and sure, we'll break sure. them down. So let me let me start with the first one. Um, a lot of questions about um, pay to play. So um, so Yelp has, as you know, has long faced accusations of pay to play where uh, essentially, you know, you you charge to keep up good reviews or high listings. C can you can you address that? Um, is that something that Yelp does? Um, can businesses pay to get uh, better reviews? placed higher. Um, what, what's, what's, what's your, what's your response to that? The answer is of course, absolutely not. That's never been the case. And in fact, you can prove it to yourself. Uh, look at any one of our advertisers and see if you find negative reviews. Chances are you will because everyone gets the occasional 
negative review. And so if there was a delete negative review button that you could pay for, presumably people would be, be using it. But yeah, you know, I would say Yelp has been the canary in the coal mine on this misinformation issue. Uh, you know, when it comes to sort of accusations that get spread through social media, this is something that, you know, we've been dealing with for a decade. Obviously, there's lots of business owners out there. Uh, and when they don't, you know, when some of them don't like their you know, what they see on their Yelp page, they come up with theories or reasons why, you know, the, the Yelp rating doesn't mean anything to them, why it doesn't matter. And, and I can kind of understand that you have this rating out there that you can't control, which is by design, and you get frustrated with it. And so the natural thing is to say, oh, well, I, I think it's pay to play, or I heard it's pay, to, you know, this friend of mine told me. And so it's kind of this rumor mill thing uh, that gets started, spread on social media, propagated, uh, repeated, uh, unfortunately, in the media, and then is seen to be, well, it must be true because where there's smoke, there's fire. But it turns out, you know, courts have looked at it, FTC has looked at it, we've been tested in every which way and orifice possible <laughs> at this point, and the reality is we don't. You know, we, yeah. we try to be a fair referee and create a level playing field, and I think we do a good job of that, which is why we get the criticism, uh, because it turns out, you know, if you let your guard down, like some of our competitors, Google, for instance, doesn't take as harsh a stance on, you know, allowing people to solicit reviews or fake reviews or what have you, like ratings tend to be more positive. And business owners love that. But guess what? That's not great for your pocketbook as a consumer. And so we're trying to strike the right balance between business owners and consumers. A lot of questions also about negative reviews. Um, mm -hmm. Some people, you know, saying, look, they're a tool for people who want to hurt businesses for one reason or another. Um, I can give you an example from from my own experience, not on Yelp, but I have a book out, and mm -hmm. and and I promised people who pre-ordered it that I would send them a signed book plate. I'm signing thousands of them. They're, they'll arrive. I haven't separately. gotten mine yet. You haven't gotten yours yet. Where's it's mine? coming. Um, but somebody wrote a one-star review of my book on Amazon because they didn't receive their signed book plate, which is frustrating because I worked on that book for 18 months, and it's it's yeah. really something that I I led and sweated out for our listeners. It's not an expensive book. So it's frustrating because it brings your rating down. Um, is Why isn't there a mechanism to hold reviewers accountable to, to say, hey, you know, because I can point to thousands of examples. You've heard them of restaurants getting pummeled by people who don't like them because of a political stance they took. For example, the Red Hen restaurant that didn't serve Sarah Huckabee Sanders got pummeled by people who gave it one star reviews. Is, is, is there a mechanism that could be created to hold reviewers accountable so they can't manipulate the reviews like that? Well, I think we're talking about two different things there. There's sort of like Yelp becoming a bit of a political or other review sites becoming a bit of a political platform when there's some sort of political scandal associated with the business or other scandal. And, and that we have a separate mechanism for dealing with. We can put up an alert on the page and we actually pull down uh, the content right. that's unrelated to the actual business. We do, you know, uh, try to point to what's happening in the media so people have the context of what's going on with the but business. But even if somebody were to alert. like write a review about the restaurant, just a negative review that's just made yeah. up because they don't like the business owner. I mean, mm -hmm. isn't there a, is there a way to hold that reviewer accountable or at least make sure that their identity is clear to maybe to prevent that? Are there ways to prevent we that? Do. Something yeah, we do. We do have very aggressive mechanisms that try to create a level playing field. And I guess stepping back for a second, it's important to remember that 80% of the reviews on Yelp are three stars and up. So there is a, you know, and I get it. Like I, as a business owner, you know, I, I also get negative feedback, whether through the media or other places, like I'm not immune to it. It stings. You remember it for years. Like I'm bitter about many stories <laughs> that have happened over the years. I could name the reporters, but you have to, you know, you have to remind yourself it's the big picture that counts. No one's going to have a perfect record. Uh, and it turns out, actually, the occasional negative just shows that you are a real person, uh, that things go wrong. Or there's also crazy customers that does exist. But Yelp has a mechanism where 25 percent on average of reviews are not shown on the businesses page. And we are by far the most aggressive of any review site out there. And the reason why we do that is for there, there are a few. But one is obviously business owners try to game the system. It does happen all the time, whether it's writing fake reviews for themselves, emailing their uncle, saying review me, what have you. But then also for consumers, you know, sometimes there might be a malicious, you know, it could be a competitor that's driving by on your page and, and writing a negative review, or it could just be, you know, random 
uh, you know, person that, that, that Yelp right. can't trust for one reason or the, another. And so we set aside 25% of the content on Yelp, which is unprecedented. It hurts the site, like from a business standpoint, because we have less content, you know, business owners that, that have reviews, you know, it's better for business, frankly. But we do that because we truly care about making sure that Yelp is a useful service, that it is a service that consumers can rely on, which means there is going to be negative content. And people, you, you can think about the people reviewing, you know, looking at your Amazon page. They're not going to look at that one review and say, oh, I'm not buying this book because this, you know, guy has one negative review there. They're going to look at the overall rating. They're going to flip through. They're you hope, see it, right? You know, the I mean, no, you I, know. I, I mean, think about yourself as a consumer. When yeah, you go through I know. a page with reviews, do you look at that one negative review and say, that's it, I'm done? No, no I you, don't. You look I, at the I don't. overall picture. Yeah, I don't. And I, I, but, you know, we're living in a time with so much misinformation and disinformation. It's hard to know if, if someone on Twitter is a Russian bot or uh, coming, you know, like some kind of troll farm in, mm -hmm. in you know, Eastern Europe or Ukraine. It's just impossible to know. And, um, and, and it's the same with, 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 with sort of anonymous reviews. I, I guess I wonder whether there are, there are mechanisms. Are there ways to, if if we assume that let's say ten percent or five percent of people who are doing this are just trolls, is is there a way that is is there technology to 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 root them out? I mean, definitely in the in the case of you know bots, you know malicious spam things like that. Yeah, absolutely. There's like that's part of the twenty five percent that we take off of the page. Is you know we are using software algorithms to identify suspicious patterns and th you know things that we don't want to show consumers. So we do take it absolutely seriously. I mean, I think in your earlier comment there was maybe an insinuation that you know is there a way to prove that the person transacted? Yeah. And there is this right. like false, I would call it very false belief that if you prove that someone transacted, then that review is therefore trustworthy. But all you have to do is like read one of the 20 stories on Amazon about how people still easily game that system because like, oh, you could send the product to someone, reimburse them for buying it, and then they write a fake review for you and now consumers are misled. So it's very easy even in a transactional system if the incentives are there because ultimately like people want to sell more product or, right. you know, like there's, there's still very, there's a lot of money in gaming the system. And so people are going to game the system whether you're like tracking transactions or not. We're able to track some of the transactions. You know, we have restaurant reservations, for instance, that, that are available on the site, uh, you know, things like food delivery orders, we, we have right. transaction records. And so it's a tool, but it's not a golden bullet by any means. And there's plenty of examples where the site, I personally can't rely, I don't rely at all on Amazon reviews, because I don't think they take the system very seriously. I think they use it as a way to just sell stuff. But, you know, personally, I go to Wirecutter, which is a, a division right. of the New York Times, yep. for all my, my consumer product uh, purchases. I see those pillows behind you. Maybe, maybe get those through our culture. Um, Jeremy, we've yeah. got a couple of minutes <laughs> left and I want to ask you about, I want to ask you about to put your entrepreneur's head on because we have a lot of people watching who are entrepreneurs who've got yeah. small, small businesses and are, are really looking for ideas um, or people are thinking about it. Um, we mentioned that how, when you launched Yelp, it didn't get a whole lot of traction it, and it was really, I mean, I, I think you described it as like this dark period. You were worried you were, you were, you were just like driving your team off a cliff. Um, I yeah, think that yeah. those are the words you used. Um, right now, it's a pretty dark period um, for a lot of businesses. What I mean, what advice do you have for people who 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 might feel like they're 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 driving, leading their teams off a cliff right now? I mean, what what would you say to them? I mean, I in crisis, the number one thing I think is is staying calm and just you know one foot in front of the other. Uh, you know, there was an important lesson I remember from my PayPal days. Uh, you know, we were we were up late. You know, I was with the team. We were up late, and we had like a bad code push, and the site wouldn't come back up. So PayPal was basically down initially, down on, on purpose. But we couldn't get the site back up, and it was like stretching on hours and hours. And we had this very senior database administrator who had kind of battle hardened. He had seen it all, and I was literally in a panic. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god. What are we gonna do? Get this thing out. Like I was in full on panic mode, and the guy was just so calm and collected, and like no nonsense. And we're gonna try this, and then we're gonna try that. And it was a, that was an important lesson for me. Uh, you know, whereas no matter how crazy things get, like there is zero benefit. 
to being in panic mode. And the absolute best thing you can do is try to calm yourself down, take a moment, think about things and figure out what is one thing you can do right now? Like, what is the next step? You know, what, if your, your business isn't working, what's something new you could try? Is there something adjacent? Um, that would be, that would be my best advice. And, and I was leaning on that very much. So, you know, yeah. in, in February or in March, uh, March, April. You, you left business school, you dropped out of business school to start Yelp, um, which was risky. Um, with, you know, with so much uncertainty right now, and, and the fact that we're living in, a, in, a, you know, in the midst of an economic crisis, um, do you think it's a good time to, to start a business, to take a risk right now and to start something? It's an interesting question. There's probably certain sectors uh, where, yes, it probably makes sense to be thinking about laying the groundwork. Particularly hard-hit sectors are usually good ones because there's not a lot of competition. People aren't really investing. Uh, you know, so thinking about, say, you know, a new restaurant concept right now and, and doing the early work so that as we come out of the pandemic, you're like you're ready to go like that. That can be valuable. Uh, I mean, we are in a weird, distorted market. And in, in, in my view, you, know, you obviously have the Fed, you know, bringing interest rates uh, down and then you have a lot of you know, software as a service company valuations are, are through the roof. And, you know, some of the tech companies valuations are through the roof. So there are some areas that feel inflated and there seems to be a lot of investment continuing but i'd say looking at some of those areas that are harder hit uh or if you have to be working in one of those areas that's harder hit it is a good time to think creatively of like what can you do differently what can you do that's novel and new and probably not a lot of people are working on it right now all right i'm going to ask this one last question for tron kim because i think tron is probably a business owner and and this is going to be helpful to tron for coming from youtube tron asks um what tools do you have for businesses to fight back against fake reviews or reviews that they think are were planted by a mm -hmm. competitor or something like that? We do have flagging. Uh, so if you log into your business, business owner, owner dashboard, biz.yelp.com, you can go in there and mark a review as suspicious or give us you know, some context around it. We, we do have a human staff as well, in addition to all the algorithms and whatnot that will take a look at reviews. Also, you can respond. And that's one of the most powerful tools I think out there because think about yourself as a customer. If you see a negative review, you might read that and say, oh, that's weird. But then if you see a very thoughtful reply from the business owner, a personal, like empathetic, hey, I'm sorry it went this way, you know, when, when you came into my restaurant, you know, that isn't how we, how we normally do things. And, and please, you know, ask for me by name. I, I want to, you know, stop by and thank you for your visit. You know, it's like that type of communication can completely neutralize uh, a situation that was bad, or, or even if you aren't familiar with, with that particular customer, just treating it seriously, showing that you care, I think goes a long way for that next customer that's going to look at your business page. And I look at those all the time. I love when, when business owners respond to it's review. Great. I think it's really great. Um, Jeremy, what, what, last question for you. When, when you, when we're done with this pandemic, hopefully, and, and, and we can return to something that is normal, it's going to be mm -hmm. different, but normal. What, what do you want to take with you from this time what, that you've learned about yourself as a leader that you will take with you into the future and apply to how you, how you operate as a leader? I think communication is the key. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there is enough communication that I could do <laughs> at Yelp right now. I just think, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of uncertainty, both because of the business, but even more so, you know, in our society and, and politics, obviously. And so the more that you can project that sort of calm confidence, you know, we're going to get through this one foot in front of the other. Here's the actions that we're taking. Here's what we know right now. I think the better people feel and the more people can stay focused, you know, on, on our shared mission. And so that's, that's probably my best takeaway take is like, you've never done enough communication within your organization. So keep reminding people what they're up to, why they're doing it, and that you're there to support them. Jeremy Stoppelman. Founder and CEO of Yelp, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Great thank to see you. you. Great to see you. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. Just before you go, just want a couple quick announcements. Um, next week, we've got Jennifer Neundofer. Uh, she's co-founder of January Ventures. It's an investment firm for pre-seed and seed stage tech startups. So check that out on Tuesday. Don't forget, we had a new episode of How I Built This Drop on Monday. It's Sal Khan of Khan Academy. It's such an inspiring story. If you are feeling down right now, and, and, and filled with despair about the world around you and our country and all this craziness, listen to that episode. It will, it's like a shot in the arm. It's such a, it, I was feeling sad and I had already interviewed Khan and then I, Sal Khan and I had listened to it and I felt better. It was really, really great. So please check it out. 
Also, um, we got a new book out, How I Built This. The book is out. If you love this show, if you value what we do, um, please check out this book. It's going to be something that I hope will inspire you on your journey. Um, so we will see you back here on Tuesday. Uh, go back and listen to our episode. Listen to Jeremy Stoppelman's episode um, that we did in, in 2019 on Yelp. It's so good. Jeremy, thanks again. Thank you. Goodbye, see you everybody. Next time. <laughs>